okay, why don't we begin, make a transition from the study of social perception to the study of social memory, just by making some summary comments about the function of perception. And this is the function of perception regardless of whether we're talking about social, the social domain, or the non-social domain. What happens in perception is that a person performs, the person forms an internal mental representation of some object or event that, uh, that exists or occurs in the external, uh, the physical world. And the important thing about perception is that our behavior with respect to the objects in the world is governed by our perception of them, not by the objects themselves. It's the mental representation that causes, uh, that causes our behavior to occur. Um, whether you're a, whether you're, the, the stimulus comes in the form of a verbal description or a set of physical features, whether you're a, uh, Gibson, a, a Brunerian constructivist or a proponent of Gibson's ecological viewpoint in perception, the important thing is to get that mental representation out. But it turns out that all, percep sorry, all perceptual activity has a particular end point, and that is with the identification and categorization of the stimulus. The act of perception is not completed until you've not only figured out where the stimulus is and what it's doing, but figured out what the stimulus is. You've classified it in terms of some group of things with which you're already, uh, you're already familiar. And in that respect, at least, perceptual activity always depends on memory, because it's by virtue of the connection between the perceptual apparatus and the memory that we're able to identify objects as familiar or not, and able to categorize them into various kinds of classification. Jerome Bruner, about whom I talk a lot, uh, put this very uh, pithily, uh, this set of Brunerian aphorisms uh, that psychologists like to uh, um, uh, uh, point to. And one of these is that every act of perception ends, uh, is an act of categorization. And if that's true, that every act of perception involves an act of categorization, then the only way you can do that, the only way you can categorize an object, is by taking this internal mental representation that you formed through the perceptual process and connect it up to pre-existing knowledge that's stored somehow in memory. So what we want to do now is to talk about that memory. Just to put a final touch on it, let's look at the two different ways in which perception and memory relate to each other. Um, the first is, what I've been talking about so far, is that memory provides the cognitive background against which perception occurs. It's memory that stores our fund of knowledge and expectations and beliefs that we use to identify and categorize objects. And it's also the case that memories are themselves a byproduct of perceptual activity. What we perceive is going to determine what we remember. Okay, you can't remember something you didn't perceive to begin with. Uh, one way to think about the memory trace is that the memory trace is a record of whatever processing you engaged in while you were perceiving an object. But perhaps more familiar way to think about a memory is that it's just a description of something you perceived in the past. Okay, uh, and exactly what that description looks like is what we're going to talk about um, for the next couple of lectures. Let's make the connect another connection between the literature on person perception, social perception, and social memory by looking at various models of face recognition. It's one thing to perceive an object as a face. It's one thing to perceive an, a, 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 a face as expressing anger or disgust or whatever. It's one thing to think that face is beautiful. It's another thing entirely to identify that face with some particular person. And we now have a fairly good understanding of uh, what that process is, uh, looks like. It's not a trivial process, it turns out. It's quite interesting. Um, and the, the database um, the, behind these models of face recognition uh, is, is itself really quite varied. First, people make mistakes in face perception. They do that all the time. Um, and you can kind of classify what kinds of mistakes uh, that people make and use that list of uh, face recognition errors to, uh, to begin to get some sense of what kinds of processes are involved. The analysis of error is a very important method in experimental psychology and the rest of cognitive science because it turns out that when people make mistakes, that often reveals the, under, uh, the processes underlying uh, their performance. Second, there is a group of uh, neuropsychological syndromes, a group of syndromes associated with brain damage, uh, various forms of brain damage, some of which seem to involve a specific problem in the recognition of faces. I'm going to talk about this more when we talk about social neuroscience. Uh, it turns out that the situation is a little bit more complicated than that, but for now, let's just go uh, with a basic idea that there's a, a, a neurological syndrome known as prosopagnosia, agnosia, inability to know, um, where the patient can't uh, recognize faces as familiar to him, to him or her. They can recognize something as a face, they can um, uh, even describe the face as beautiful or angry or whatever, typically, but if it's the face of somebody they're supposed to know, they can't attach a name to the face. And that's what we, what we really mean by facial, facial recognition, is attaching a name to a face. Nevertheless, these individuals who can't recognize faces that ought to be familiar to them, that is, can't recognize them as familiar, uh, can also can make all sorts of other judgments about these faces. They can tell you whether it's a male or a female face, they can tell you whether it's angry or, uh, or, uh, or, or happy. They can even read lips, okay? So if somebody is mouthing some words, they can figure out what those, uh, what those words are. They just can't recognize the face itself. And that suggested to some people that there is a particular brain module or brain structure that is involved in face recognition. It turns out that people with prosopagnosia tend to have damage in a particular part of the brain right there. Uh, it's known as the fusiform gyrus or the fusiform area that's located basically where the uh, occipital lobe and the temporal lobe uh, come together. So there it is in a side view of the brain. Here it is in a, a, re a rear view of the brain. And here a view from the underside. You can uh, get, get a sense of where this is located. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, right there where these things come together uh, is the fusiform area. And if you think about temporal lobe having something to do with processing of memory and the occipital lobe having something to do with processing of visual input, it makes sense that. Um, um, uh, something like prosopagnosia would be identified with a structure round about there. Okay, so uh, evidence from careful testing of prosopagnosic patients uh, can tell us something about processes and facial recognition. And then there are neurologically normal individuals, mostly college sophomores, um, who are brought into the laboratory and asked to perform various kinds of facial recognition tasks. And uh, typically, either we look for um, errors in face rec recognition or we look at reaction time studies of facial recognition and we get evidence about the process that way. One of the, most, one of the interesting things um, uh, about these reaction time studies um, is that uh, it's, it takes people less time to recognize a, a face as familiar than it takes to attach an occupation uh, to the name. And it takes less time to attach an occupation to the name than it, uh, than it is to name the face that the person, that name the person that the face belongs to. That, I think, has got to count as a counterintuitive finding. You'd think people would be faster naming a face than, than doing the occupation. I'm not so sure about that one, but that is, that is the way the, way, the, way the, um, 
uh, uh, literature comes out, individuals basically can't name a face uh, without being able to state the occupation of the person that the face belongs to. Again, I don't know about that, but in any event, this kind of evidence has led uh, Bruce and Young, two English uh, psychologists, to produce a kind of consensual model, that is a model about which most people agree, of the face recognition process. And what it looks like, ah, what it looks like here is that you've got this visual input about a face, you present a face to the person, and the first thing that happens is that there's some kind of structural encoding process, which is really what, the, what we usually mean by, uh, when we talk about perception. You get a description of the face, uh, where the eyes are, what color the eyes are, how long the nose is, and, uh, and all of that. And uh, then you get a, a description of the face independent of whatever emotion is being expressed uh, on the face. Then information from the structural encoding then is passed to another process known as a face recognition unit, which recognizes the face as a face, and then recognizes the face as a familiar face. That's all it is. I've seen this face before. Then you get um, uh, uh, the information passed on to another system that is basically a person identity system that identifies the person that the face uh, belongs to, and then you actually generate the name. Here in the cognitive system is all the information that you know about, uh, about this person, and notice that the connection uh, between the facial recognition process and the cognitive system is at the level of the person identity node. This is why apparently you can retrieve information about somebody's occupation um, before, you can retrieve, um, before you can retrieve their name. And there are all sorts of other things you can do with faces. You can analyze their emotional expression, a la Paul Ekman. You can do facial speech analysis. You can lip read. Um, or you can engage in uh, directed visual processing. That's when you tell somebody they've got a milk mustache or something like that. You're not identifying the face. You're just describing something about, uh, about the individual's face. In this model, all of these functions are dissociable from each other, which is to say that you can do one without being able to do another. Um, so that the structural encoding can be input to uh, facial speech analysis, and you can engage in lip reading, as prosopagnosic patients uh, typically can do, without being able to recognize the name uh, itself. That's the general idea uh, behind these things. I'm going to skip over that because that's just another way of presenting uh, this model, except uh, to make a point here, this is a so-called connectionist model of face processing, where you've got facial recognition units, there's been these faces that you know, these are British investigators, Prince Charles, Princess Diana, Margaret Thatcher, Richard, uh, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, and so on. These facial recognition units have input to the personal identity nodes, okay, so you can identify the faces, but it's only from the personal identity nodes that you can get semantic information about whether they're uh, members of the British uh, royalty or prime minister or associated with Watergate or whatever. The personal identity node is the key to retrieving other information about a person in this particular model. Yeah. Well, they based it on this kind of research, okay? These kind of these kinds of research. They didn't just come out come with it out of their head. And again, it's this counterintuitive finding that you can identify a person's occupation before you can name the person. That's weird, okay? Uh, but it comes up over and over and over again. Uh, I don't know what the issue is uh, there, but it's that kind of data. And the, the idea that prosopagnosis can uh, identify the emotional expression of a face without being able to name a face, all of the all of this data is consistent with the Bruce and Young model. That's why it's so widely accepted. But again, the point here is that the act of perception, perceiving a person, uh, isn't really complete until you've identified who that person is and retrieve some information about that person. Uh, he's a neurotic. He's a he's a man. Uh, he's a, he's an extrovert or whatever. That completes the act of perception, and that completion of the act of perception requires that we, that we retrieve information about that person from memory, because people don't wear signs around, except at cocktail parties, they usually don't wear signs and say, hi, I'm John, I'm a neurotic extrovert, uh, or, or whatever, yeah. Yeah, I, that might be part of it. That's a really interesting idea. Uh, I think another aspect of it is in these studies, the, 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 the familiar faces that people are asked to recognize are often uh, public figures, like movie stars. So it's very easy for someone to say, oh, yeah, that's a movie star. Oh, it's Angelina Jolie, something like that. I mean, I wouldn't know Angelina Jolie if she ran into me on the street, right? But if I saw her face and somebody said, you know, well, it's kind of, I, I've seen the face, right? Uh, she looks like a movie star to me. That's the kind of thing that's going to get the, um, the, the identification of the occupation before the face, before, before, the, before the name. So I think there's actually some kind of artifact there in the way these studies are done. Uh, but your idea is a good one. That's one that could be experimentally addressed. There's a senior honors thesis for you. Right. There you go. Okay, so now let's look at memory itself. Let's get beyond the perception process uh, and see how, see how memory works. When psychologists talk about memory, they usually don't think about memory as one big thing. They think about memory as at least two uh, big things. We make a distinction ah, We make a distinction between uh, declarative memory on the one hand and procedural memory on, uh, on the other hand. Declarative memory is memory uh, for factual knowledge, uh, either knowledge like Kilstrom is a professor or Columbus discovered America or China is in Asia. A Asia. All declarative knowledge can be expressed in sentence-like propositional format where there's a subject, a verb, and, uh, and an object. The other major form of memory is what we call procedural memory, and procedural memory is really the person's repertoire of skills and uh, rules and things like that that are used to guide uh, action and various kinds of uh, uh, various kinds of marketing, uh, uh, motor, act, uh, motor activities. So we've got this big distinction between declarative and procedural memory, and we've got this other big distinction within the declarative memory, two different kinds of uh, declarative memory, episodic and semantic. Episodic memory is memory for particular events that occurred at a particular time and a particular place. If I say to you, I had uh, rice for dinner last night, that is an event in my life that's associated with a particular time and a particular uh, place. If I say to you, rice is a grain that's often eaten for dinner, that is a that's an abstract statement about the nature of rice, and that knowledge would be retrieved from semantic, uh, semantic memory. On the procedural side, we might distinguish between motor and cognitive skills, that is, skills uh, that are displayed in actual overt activity and skills that are displayed in covert mental activity. I'll give you some examples of that um, in a second, but that's the basic breakdown. And I, I'll give you that because in these lectures, we're going to focus on declarative memory, okay? And we're going to focus on how we remember uh, information about someone that we've met, uh, what's, known as, uh, what's known as person memory. Okay, so again, declarative memory is memory uh, holds knowledge of, uh, of a factual nature. If the philosophers would say it has truth value, which is to say not that it's true, but it's either true or not, right? And you can give all pieces of declarative memory some kind of propositional representation um, so that you get examples like John smiled at Lucy or neurotics are anxious and excitable uh, or whatever. These are all sentence-like propositional, um, propositional statements. 
Okay, and uh, in terms of psychological theory, we often represent declarative knowledge in what's known as an associative network uh, structure, where there are particular nodes, think of it as a graph, almost like a graph, uh, nodes that represent concepts, and then there are associative links that, re that represent the relations among concepts. And the general idea is that when we perceive something out in the world, that active perception ad activates uh, nodes corresponding to the event in, um, in, uh, in memory, and then this activation spreads across the associative links from one, uh, from one concept to another. And this spreading activation process uh, that forms the basis for uh, what are known as priming effects, very important uh, the effect uh, in uh, the psychological theory and research, where processing one event uh, facilitates processing of another event. That's what priming effects uh, generally, um, uh, generally are. So let's give you an example of this. Um, there is, believe it or not, an entire book in psychology written based on one sentence. The hippie touched the debutante. Okay? Um, and what the author did was to kind of unpack what it takes to uh, store such knowledge in memory and, uh, and, and retrieve it from memory. So what we've got here is a node representing the hippie, and we've got another node representing the debutante, and you've got an associative link that re represents the fact that the hippie touched the debutante. Or you could do another way, a more linguistic representation, where the hippie is the subject term in the proposition, the debutante is the object term in the uh, uh, proposition, and touched, the verb, is the relation term. We're not going to worry about uh, the benefits or vices associated with uh, uh, these alternate representations. I just want to give you a sense of how this kind of knowledge tends to be represented in memory when we think about it uh, in terms of psychological theory. So you get a sentence like, the hippie touched the debutante, okay? And this is a, uh, the nodes representing hippies and debutantes and touching uh, kind of get lit up, and then activation will spread to, things, to uh, terms that are associated with each of these individuals. So hippies drive VW buses, and VW buses are a kind of automobile, and an automobile is a kind of vehicle, and hippies tend to have stringy hair and long hair, right? So those are facts that you know about hippies. And the debutantes tend to drive Porsches, which are cars and vehicles, and the debutantes tend to be blonde and have long hair. Um, and uh, kissing is a form of contact. Uh, another form of contact is, 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 is kiss. So when you see a hippie touch a debutante, Nodes representing hippies and debutantes and touching get activated in memory, and then this activation spreads to other knowledge that you have in memory. So, for example, if I say uh, to you, uh, having said the hippie touched the debutante, I now say, do hippies have long, stringy hair? You're going to be very likely to be able to access that information in memory by virtue of priming effects. That's basically um, how this works. And I've gone through all this because we're going to see how people use priming effects over and over and over again uh, in, the, in the next uh, lecture or two. Okay, so now let's look at for a moment. That's declarative memory. There's a hippie that touched the debutante some, uh, someplace. Let's look at what, uh, what uh, is specific to episodic memory. Episodic memory, as I said before, always has an autobiographical uh, quality to it. Episodic memory refers to particular events that were experienced by a person, directly or indirectly, uh, at a particular time and a particular place. Uh, so the elements of an episodic memory, there's some description of an event, like the hippie touched the debutante, but that doesn't exactly make it an episodic memory. First, the first thing that happens, that happens is you have to have information about episodic context. What, when did this take place? Where did this take place? The hippie touched the debutante in the park on Thursday. Now that becomes more of a episodic uh, memory. If I say, well, the hippie touched the debutante because he was rescuing her after she fell in the lake, okay, uh, we've got some causal relations here, makes it even more of an episodic memory, we've got some explanation for why this thing occurred. Uh, and then finally, what makes uh, uh, you know, an episodic memory really an episodic memory is that there is some reference to the self. The hippie touched the debutante, that's just an abstract thing, okay? What makes uh, that a real episodic memory is that I saw the hippie touch the debutante, or I was the hippie who touched the debutante, or in another world, I was the debutante that the hippie touched, uh, or whatever, okay? That there's some kind of self-reference of uh, some individual, the, the, uh, the person doing the remembering, as the agent or patient of some action, you're the hippie or the debutante, right? Or the stimulus or experiencer of some state. If I say, I made Lucy happy today, I'm the stimulus for Lucy's happiness. If I say, Lucy made me happy today, that's an episodic memory, she's the stimulus for my, uh, for my experience. And then, uh, for self-reference, you might have something, some reference to the individual's internal mental state. I was appalled when the hippie touched the debutante. I was shocked when the hippie touched the debutante. Something about me as the, as the person who witnessed this whole thing. Yeah? So if I can think about it, I can always always think of the memory, even if it isn't memory in the case, the memory is always in the case. Yeah, I suppose in all of these things there's some level of self-reference, but sometimes it's more important than others. So if I say to you, Columbus discovered America in 1492, yeah, you learned that fact at some point. But that's really not part of your episodic memory. You weren't there. Um, you don't even remember, remember probably where you learned that. It was probably second grade, maybe first grade, uh, but uh, you don't really know. It's not part of your own personal uh, memory. That would be more like a semantic memory. There's a fact, an abstract fact that Columbus discovered America in 1492. When I say the hippie touched the debutante, you know, that does refer to a specific action, I suppose. Right? It's, it's more specific than if I said hippies touched debutante, okay, which is a fact about hippies. Right? Uh, but it still doesn't have that, the, 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 the uh, spatial temporal reference and the self-reference that you really want to have when you have uh, uh, an episodic memory. But yes, all semantic memories are going to begin in episodic form. One day you ran home from school and told your mom and dad, Mom and dad, Columbus discovered America in 1492. And that was something you experienced indirectly at the time, but pretty soon you forgot about Mrs. Bennett or whoever it was who told you that, uh, that was a particular experience. Um, now sometimes uh, you can have, this is a little tricky, because sometimes you can have uh, what looks like a personal memory that really isn't, okay? Uh, a couple of years ago, the very last survivor of the Titanic thinking died. And uh, she was identified, and I forget her name now, she was identified in obituaries as the last survivor of the Titanic, and she actually gave talks about being the last survivor of the Titanic. She was something like four months old at the time. She has no memory, no direct memory of the sinking of the Titanic, right? So that's, it's not really an episodic memory for her. Uh, what she, uh, as you'll see in a little, when we talk about the self, there's a difference between episodic memory about the self and semantic memory about the self, okay? Uh, I'm of Swedish, Scots, Irish, Finnish extraction. That's a semantic memory that I have about myself. Um, and for her, I'm a survivor of the Titanic was just something she knew about herself, but not really an episodic memory. So that's, it, at, at, the, at the boundaries, the distinction is fuzzy. So that's why I'm trying to have pretty clear boundaries uh, for this. One more question, then I gotta go on. There's, I had, most animal cognition people, if you talk to uh, Professor uh, Lucia Jacobs, 